Well, as we um, have, have uh, presented here, we the National Park Service is working with a whole bunch of people to help keep this story alive and to help remember the events that happened here. And really, it would not be possible if it wasn't for our key partner, the Friends of Port Chicago Naval Magazine National Memorial, and helping us to do that. And at this time, I would like to invite uh, my dear friend and the president of the Friends of Port Chicago, Reverend Diana McDaniel. Port Chicago. We're a nonprofit group. We're a public benefit organization and we exist to honor those who died and who were injured in the explosion. And we work to keep the story alive by increasing public knowledge and increasing support of this national monument. We support the National Park Service. We work to enhance student and visitor education. And because it's difficult to visit this park, uh, we have recently created a virtual website. You can go to www.friendsofportchicago.org or to portchicagomemorial.org. And I'm going to invite our uh, members of our board to come forward and join me. And that's David Salnicker and Cameron Madigan and Robert. You have to stay right there. You can't come. <laughs> Is Zoe here? I don't know Zoe who's here. <laughs> uh, this is Cameron and this is David. We have uh, Mark Bruner, Zoe Polk, Kathy Hoffman, who's out of town, and, and they couldn't be here today. Uh, and we and Robert Allen, who's a founding member of our board, of our group, and, uh, and and I want you to know we have an extraordinarily talented group of people, and we work very well together. And I lo we love working with the National Park Service. You, you guys are wonderful. And before I go on, I want to invite you to E106. Make sure you come over. We have refreshments. There's food. <laughs> and a movie, a short movie, and, and we invite you to learn more about who we are. Now we're all standing here, but we wouldn't have gotten involved if Dr. Allen hadn't done a yeoman's job of creating a buzz about Port Chicago and putting it on paper for us to read about this particular historical event. Robert was born and reared in the segregated South. And it was so segregated in, his, in the years that he grew up, he was unaware there was a larger community in the state because everything was available to him and his community. He had no need to go into the larger community because black businesses were thriving in Atlanta and it was self-sufficient. He was a Morehouse man. He received his master's degree from the New School for Social Research and his doctorate from the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Allen has been a professor since 1972 and just retired from teaching at Cal. He's published more than 10 books, many chapters and textbooks and anthologies, tons of articles and journals, and for almost four decades worked with the Black Scholar and retired as, as its senior editor. In essence, without Robert's work, without his writing the Port Chicago Mutiny, without letting us know of the largest mutiny trial in U.S. naval history, it's unlikely you'd be sitting here today on this property the 392nd National Park. Robert is a human rights activist, a historian, a great man, and we want to say, <laughs> he's laughing at me, you are a great man, you've done great work. So thank you, Dr. Allen, for all you've done for us to remember Port Chicago. And David.
I have the brief honor of presenting this plaque, which I'd like to uh, read. This is to make sure you know why you were getting this award. For the many years of dedicating yourself to the education of the public, social, and military injustices, this award is to say thank you for Dr. Allen's scholarship, his authorship, his enduring and heroic commitment to telling the Port Chicago story and keeping this story of immense human struggle alive because of your passion for everyone being treated with respect and dignity, the story will not be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you very much to my colleagues on the Friends of Port Chicago. Ah, and <laughs> there's a hard copy of the book, the first edition, I do believe. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'll be happy to sign that for you if <laughs> you haven't gotten it signed. And we have more. <laughs> okay, this is promotion. We have more copies available, which will be over in E106. Uh, when do we go for refreshments? I want to say that I'm deeply moved to be honored in, in, in this way. And um, it's a very special occasion, of course, to be here and to see all of you here uh, today. I uh, didn't know what kind of turnout that would be because it's sort of an off year and, and the, the weather, we didn't know what was going to happen with the weather. But it's so wonderful to see that so many of you came out today. We have really a full house. And we do appreciate it because it shows that the, the interest is growing in what happened here, the story, the outcome, the events that happened here, which are of not only local and regional significance, but national significance uh, as well. And in accepting this, this award, I really want to accept it in memory of the sailors, the men who worked here, the men who served here, the men who died here at Port Chicago because my work has actually been about memory. It's been about the re remembrance of Port Chicago. And in that regard, I've actually uh, been working on this for over three and a half decades now, uh, starting in 1977. And in a way, this is my life's work. Um, 36 years of uh, work on and off on it. Of course, I, I, will, I will say that in some ways, I feel like it's a calling. It is a calling. To, 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 to do this work. And by a calling, I mean a calling is something that you cannot not do. You must do it. A calling is, calls us to, to do some, some work. And I will admit that I have sometimes wandered away from my calling. I have sometimes taken, taken a break, but I always get called back to the work. I always get recalled, so to speak. And I appreciate that because this is the work that I have been devoting my, my life to and which I will continue to do. I actually first became aware of this calling in 1977 when I came across a copy of the pamphlet that has um, been mentioned here with regard to the, uh, um, the, 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 the disaster that happened in 1945. The pamphlet was written uh, by the NACP Legal Defense Fund, which was headed by Thurgood Marshall. It was published in 1945. I happened to come across a copy of it in 1977 while I was doing some other research. And the, the first line in that pamphlet caught my eye. I have never forgotten it. That line was, remember Port Chicago? Question mark. It was a question. Remember Port Chicago? No. Oh. I didn't remember Port Chicago. Well, for one thing, I was only two years old when the explosion happened here. But in all of my study, um, coming through college, graduate school, I had never read about Port Chicago. I had never heard of Port Chicago. In fact, like many people, I thought it was someplace near Chicago. And I knew nothing about it. But I was intrigued. Remember Port Chicago? No, no. What happened there? The pamphlet told the story that you've heard today of the explosion, the tragedy, 
the work stoppage, the mutiny trial, the outcome of that, the outcome of what happened at Port Chicago. That story was told by this pamphlet in a brief form. I was so amazed to read this. I went and looked in the library, uh, textbooks, I could find nothing really that had been written about it. And I decided I wanted to try to do something about that. I wanted to find out what had happened in Port Chicago. A year later, I actually ordered a copy of the uh, trial uh, transcript, the mutiny trial transcript. I read that, 1,400 pages, cover to cover, and I realized, no, there are more questions here than answers about what happened in Port Chicago. I looked at other documents, the official documents from Port Chicago, the Navy Department, about what happened here. Again, there was a sense that something was missing. What I realized is that the voices of the sailors who served here were not in the official history. They were not even really in the trial uh, uh, um, transcript because the court, the military court at the trial at the time, had ruled that any testimony about events prior to July 17th, that is about events of the work that was being done here, that any testimony about that was irrelevant, could not be introduced at the trial. So the sailors were not even able to tell the story of the work that was done here and the problems that were occurring in that work, as you know now. The voices of the sailors were missing, and I realized if I wanted to really understand what had happened here, I would have to locate some survivors all those years later now and to interview and ask them about what had happened. I did that over a period of several years interviewing survivors who happened to be all over the country. Very few of them actually stayed in the Bay Area. They went back home. Home was on the East Coast, home was in the South, and that's where I found people to interview. And in the course of the, doing these interviews, I found the story then that I've written in, in that book. And I also realized, though, that the story needed to be more people really needed to be involved in, in, in this work. It was certainly much more than any one person could do. And that, in fact, the stories that were being told were bringing forward even more people who had been here at one time or people who had served in, in the military and had had similar experiences. In any case, during this time, it was, um, while it took some years to, 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 to recover these stories, it also became a very apparent parent as I was doing the interviews that many of the men had actually never told anyone about what had happened, about their stories of being here. They'd never, not even told their families. And so the urgency of doing this work became even more evident to me. The urgency of collecting the stories before the stories become lost to all memory. And so that is what I have devoted myself to. As I said, I have sometimes wandered away but I always get brought back. <laughs> and I'm always, my heart is always here, with the work here, with the story here, with the importance of this place to the history, not only of African American history and Navy history, but to the history of this country, to the history of the nation as a whole. Because it is a military history, but it is also a history of the struggle for human rights in our society. And so I feel blessed, really, that this work came my way. This calling came to me, and I now know that this calling has come to many others as well. There are other people here who have felt this calling to do this work. And so I feel that I have been joined by so many people in doing this work, so many wonderful people whom I met and come to go to, to know, but also, sadly, so many of those whom I've met and worked with have passed on. And that, of course, is very sad. But the work continues. The growth of events like this are an indication of it. The fact that not only did survivors have survivors come to these events, but the children of the survivor, of, 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 uh, of men who worked here have come to this event. The, the children of men who died here have come to these events. The children of folks who lived in Port Chicago have come to these events. These events have become a way then for all of us, in fact, to remember Port Chicago. And I finally come to understand then the calling that has brought us here. 
the calling, which is to tell the story of the people, the men who lived and served and died here, to tell that story to larger and larger audiences and to make sure that this part of the nation's history is never forgotten again. Thank you. And at this point, I'll point out that my son, Max, is in the second row here, so I'm sharing it with the next generation as well. Thank you, Robert. Um, so I think it's, it's uh, still a little windy, and, I, and um, Reverend Diana mentioned E106, where we're going to be heading pretty soon. Um, there's going to be food, and it's a lot less windy over there, so um, we'll go ahead and move in that direction. We're going to have a processional that's going to go out and go down the dock and we're going to be dropping a wreath into the water. Um, we're going to be uh, ringing a bell uh, in honor of the people who lost their lives. So if folks could stay in the memorial area, uh, the procession will go out there and you can, you can observe the procession. Uh, but right before we go on the procession, I'd like to invite Reverend Robert Thomas up to the podium to do the benediction um, and, then we can, uh, and then we can start the procession. Let us pray. God of mercy, God of grace, comfort these families and survivors in this place. The words of Henry Beecher are still true. What the heart once owned and had, it shall never lose. We come today to remember the lives and eternal love of these mighty men of valor. Though our loved ones may not be with us in the flesh, their spirit lives on in our hearts. They live on in our memories, in the stories shared and the conversations exchanged. They live on in our habits and actions, and they live on in our thoughts and our dreams. As we celebrate their lives, we realize that the healing process of our loved one's departure continues. So Lord, when we walk through the desert parts of our lives, give us strength, give us hope, and renewal to look to the one who is our healing spring. As we reminisce, we thought of our loved one with love today, but that is nothing new. We thought of you yesterday and days before that too. We think of you in silence as we often speak your name. You mean more to us than your picture in a frame. Your memory is our keepsake with which we'll never part. God has you in his keeping we have you in our heart. I am eternally indebted as a child of the segregated South. I stand on the shoulders of these 320 soldiers who have given, who gave their life of service and sacrifice. And now, may the Lord be with all of you and let his countenance shine upon you and give you peace. In his mighty name we pray. Amen.